Please welcome to the stage National Catholic Prayer Breakfast Board member Jacqueline Halbig von Schleppenbach. Good morning. This morning, it is our honor and privilege to have with us His Eminence, Robert Cardinal Serra. Prior to last year, most of us knew very little about one of the best kept secrets in Rome, but that all changed during this year's Family Synod and with the release of the new book, God or Nothing, which you can buy after the breakfast. At 34, Father Serra was appointed the youngest archbishop in the world to the West African nation of Guinea, where 85% were Muslim, the church was oppressed, and the country was being consumed in the ideological frenzy of Marxist dictator Sekou Touré, who had imprisoned the sitting archbishop. Troubled by his appointment, (laughs) Father Seurat wished not to accept it but that was not an option for St. Pope John Paul II. So putting his faith in God, he chose as his motto, Sufficit tibi gratia mea. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. As archbishop, he rose to the head of dictator Touré's assassination list, but God protected him. Cardinal Serra's unwavering determination to serve God and his people caused him to stand up to the regime at every chance he had. He said, after hundreds of hours of prayer, I came to the conclusion that the worst that could happen to me was death. My life was nothing compared to the blatant injustices, the horrible poverty, and the unspeakable horrors that I saw each day. I had to speak even if my life was at stake. Among the most important positions Cardinal Serra is known for throughout his meteoric rise, in 2001 he was named Secretary of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples by St. John Paul II. In 2010, Pope Benedict named him President of the Pontifical Council Cor Unum, which is responsible for the Church's charitable and humanitarian outreach. The following month, he was named a cardinal. In November 2014, Pope Francis named Cardinal Serra Prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of Sacraments. And now, it is my extreme honor and privilege to present to you this morning His Eminence, Robert Cardinal Serra. Brothers and sisters, it is for me a great privilege and honor to stand here among you, and I thank indeed for inviting me to this remarkable gathering in the company of such distinguished audience. As you well know, what happens in the United States has repercussions everywhere. The entire globe looks to you, waiting and praying to see what America resolves on the present on pressing challenges the world faces today. Such is your influence and responsibility. I do not say this lightly because we find ourselves in such portentous times. The situation of the world and the mission of the church 
rapid social and economic development in the past half century has not been accompanied by an equally fervent spiritual progress as we witness what Pope Francis calls globalized indifference. It is the result of giving in to the delusion that we are self-sufficient, that man is his own measure in a pervasive individualism. It is manifested in the fear of suffering in our societies, our closing our eyes and hearts to the poor and vulnerable, and in a very despicable way in how we discard the unborn and the elderly. When he prophetically announced the Second Vatican Council in the Apostolic Constitution, Humani Salutis, St. John XXIII remarked that the human community was in turmoil as it sought to establish a new world order where humanity relies entirely on technical and scientific solution instead of God. Today we are witnessing the next stage and the consummation of the efforts to build a utopian paradise on earth without God. It is a stage of denying sin and the fall altogether. But the death of God results in the burial of good, beauty, love, and truth. Good becomes e e evil. Beauty is ugly. Love becomes the satisfaction of sexual primal instincts and truth are all relative. So all manner of immorality is not only accepted and tolerated today in advanced societies, but even promoted as a social good. The result is hostility to Christians and increasingly religious persecution. Nowhere is clearer than in the thread that society are visiting on the family through demonic gender ideology, a deadly impulse that is being experienced in a world increasingly cut off from God through ideological colonialism. St. Paul John the Twenty-Third observed in 1962, tasks of immense gravity and amplitude weighed the church as in the most tragic periods of her history. The church must now inject vivifying and perennial energies of the gospel into the vein of the human community. This remains the challenge that the church is facing presently, more even than in 1962, and it is our task today. This is what I spoke of in my book, God or Nothing. Today, the church must fight against prevailing trends which courage and hope and do not and not be afraid to raise her voice to denounce the hypocrites, the manipulators, and the false prophet. For 2,000 years, the church has faced many contrary winds, but at the end of the most difficult journey, the victory was always won.
the family. The future of the world and the church passes through the family. These prophetic words of St. John Paul II show how the church in our time must, above all, defend and promote the beauty of the Christian family in the fidelity of God's design. In his post-synodal exhortation on the family, Amoris Laetitia, the, the joy of love, but Pope Francis states clearly, in no way must the church desist from proposing the full ideal of, of marriage, God's plan in all its grandeur, proposing less than what Christ offers to the human being. This is why the Holy Father openly and vigorously defend church teaching on contraception, abortion, homosexuality, reproductive technologies, the education of children, and much more. In my first five years as Archbishop of Conakry, Guinea, Africa, I made my task to dedicate all my pastoral letters to the family. Perhaps only the beauty of the family can reawaken the longing for God in the innermost recesses of the conscience of our brothers and sisters and heal the wounds inflicted on our human humanity by sin. St. John Paul II, the Pope of the New Evangelization, describes in Familiaris Consortio how the family is the first place where the gospel is welcomed and is also the first herald of the gospel, how true this is. The generous and responsible love of spouses made visible through the self-giving of parents who welcome and nurture children as a gift of God makes love visible in our generation. It makes present the perfect charity of the Trinity. If you see charity, you see the Trinity, wrote St. Augustine. From the beginning of creation, God, who is a communion of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three different persons, yet one, has built a Trinitarian sculpture into our very nature. In the continent of my origin, Africa, we declare, man is nothing without woman, a woman is nothing without man, and the two are nothing without a third element, which is the child. The trine God dwells within each of us and imbues our whole being, God's own image and likeness. Every human being, like the person of the Trinity, has the capacity to be united with other persons in communion through the vinculum caritatis, the bond of charity of the Holy Spirit. The family is a natural preparation and anticipation of the communion that is possible when we are united with God. The family, as it were, is a natural preparatio evangelica written into our heart nature. This is why the devil is so intent on destroying the family. If the family is destroyed, we lose our God-given 
anthropologi anthropological foundations and so find it more difficult to welcome the saving good news of Jesus Christ, save giving fruitful love. St. John Paul II explained, if it is true that the family is a place where more than anywhere else, human beings can flourish and truly be themselves, it is also a place where human beings can be humanly and spiritually wounded. The rupture of the foundational relationship of someone's life through separation, divorce, or distorted imposition of the family, such as cohabitation or same-sex unions, is a deep wound that closes the heart to self-giving love into death and even leads to cynicism and despair. These situations cause damage to the little children through inflicting upon them a deep existential doubt about love. They are a scandal, a stumbling block that prevents the, the most vulnerable from believing in, the, in such love and a crushing burden that can prevent them from opening to the healing power of the gospel. Advanced societies, including, I regret, this nation, have done and continue to do everything possible to legalize such situations. But this can never be a truthful solution. It is like putting bandages on the inflicted wound. It will continue to poison the body until antibiotics are taken. Sadly, the advent of artificial reproductive technologies, surrogacy, so-called homosexual marriage, and other evils of gender ideology will inflict even more wounds in the midst of generation we live with. This is why it is so important to fight to protect the family, the first cell of the life of the church and every society. It is not about abstract ideas. It is not an, an ideological war between competing ideas. This is about defending ourselves, children, and future generations from a demonic ideology that says children do not need mothers and fathers. It denies human nature and wants to cut off entire generation from God. Religious freedom. I encourage you to truly make use of the freedom willed by your founding fathers, lest you lose it. In so many other countries, on almost a daily basis, we hear of merciless beheadings, futile bombings of churches, torching of orphanages, and restless expulsion of entire families from homes that the religious minorities suffer worldwide simply because of their beliefs. Even in this yet young 21st century of barely 16 years, one million people have been martyred around the world because of their belief in Jesus Christ. Yet the violence against Christians it's not just physical, it is also political, ideological, and cultural. 
this form of religious persecution is equally damaging, yet, not, yet more hidden. It does not destroy physically, but spiritually. It demolishes the teaching of Jesus and his church, and hence the foundation of faith by, by leading souls as astray. By this violence, political leaders, lobby groups, and mass media seek to neutralize and depersonalize the conscience of Christians so as to dissolve them in fluid society without religion and without God. This is the will of the evil one, to close heaven out of envy. Do we not see signs of this insidious war in this great nation of the United States? In the name of the tolerance, the church teaching on marriage, sexuality, and the human person are dismantled. The legalization of same-sex marriage, the obligation to accept contraception within healthcare programs, and even bathroom bills that allow men to use the women's restroom and local rooms should not a biological man use the men's restroom? <laughs> How simple can that concept be? How low we are sinking for a nation built on a set of moral claims about God, the human person, the meaning of life, and the purpose of society given by America's first settler and founders. God is named in your founding documents as creator and supreme judge over individuals and government. The human person endowed with God-given and therefore inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. George Washington wrote that the establishment of civil and religious liberty was the motive that induced me to the field of battle. Today, we find ourselves before the battle of sickness that has pervaded our world. I repeat, the battle of sickness. That is what we face. I call this sickness the liquidation, the eclipse of God. Pope Francis describes the causes of this sickness, I quote, religious liberty is not only that of thought or private worship. It is freedom to live according to ethical principles consequent upon the truth found, found. Be, it, be it privately or publicly. This is a great challenge in the globalized world where weak thought, which is like a sickness, also lowers the general ethical level and in the name of the false concept of tolerance ends up by persecuting those who defend the truth about men and the ethical consequences. 
what are the remedies of this sickness? What should we, what should we do to protect the family, religious freedom, and marriage as revealed to us by God? Before such a distinguished gathering, I offer three humble suggestions. First, be prophetic. The book of Proverbs, Proverbs tells us, where there is no vision, discernment, the people perish. Discern carefully in your lives, your homes, your workplaces, how in your nation God is being eroded, eclipsed, liquidated. Blessed for Paul VI so that in 1968, when for the church, he so courageously wrote Humane Vitae. What are the threats to Christian identity and the family today? ISIS, the growing influence of China, the colonization of ideologies such as gender, how do we react? Be faithful. This is my second suggestion. Specifically for you, as men and women, called to influence even the political sphere, you have a mission of bringing divine revelation to bear in the life of your fellow, fellow citizens. Uphold the wise principle of your founding fathers. Do not be afraid to proclaim the truth with love, especially about marriage according to God's plan. Just as courageously as St. John the Baptist who risks his life to proclaim the truth. The battle to preserve the roots of mankind is perhaps the greatest challenge that our world has faced since its origins. In the words of St. Catherine of Siena, proclaim the truth and do not be silent through fear. Third, Pray. Sometimes, in front of happenings in the world, our nation, or even in the church, the results of our prayer might tempt us to become discouraged. Like Sisyphus in the Greek myth, commanded to roll a large boulder uphill only to see it roll down again as soon as it reached the top. Pope Benedict XVI in, Car in Deus Caritatis encourages us. People who pray are not wasting their time. Even though the situation appears desperate, and seems to call for action alone. Whether in doctrine or morality or everyday decisions, the heart of prayer is to dis discern God's will. This can only happen in prolonged moment of silence where, like Elijah, before the horrendous thread of Queen Jezebel, we allow the gentle breeze of God to enlighten us and confirm us along our journey to God's will. 
Such was the virginal silence of the Blessed Mother. At marriage, the wedding feast of Cana, when a new family, they have no wine, Mary, our mother, trusts in the grace given by Jesus to bestow the joy of love overflowing, Amoris Laetitia. She pronounced her very last words, do whatever he tells you. Then she remained silent. Be prophetic, be faithful, pray. That is why I came to his prayer breakfast, to encourage you, be prophetic, be faithful, and above all, pray. These three suggestions make present that the battle for the soul of America and the soul of the world is primarily spiritual. They show that the battle is fought firstly with our own conversion to God's will every day. And so I wholly welcome this initiative and join you in prayer that this great country may experience a new great spiritual awakening and help stem the tide of evil that is spreading in the world. I am confident that your efforts will no doubt contribute to protecting human life strengthening the family, and safeguarding religious freedom, not only here in these United States, but everywhere in the world. For in the end, it is God or nothing. Thank you very much. <laughs>